you build your life on your faith. talked about on Friday night. He is all God. He holds the same attributes, the essence of God. So we don't have a little piece of God or a breath of God, although it's referred that way sometimes, but because of those things, we think it's just a part of God. But the Holy Spirit is all God. That means our relation to Him is a relationship with God. So when you study God in the Bible, you realize this is how the Holy Spirit is. For example, it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He has a personality. He's a person. He has feelings. He can be grieved. He has joy. He, he has all the attributes of God. He's a person, not just a feeling or an electricity or a power. He has power, but he is not power. You follow me? Power is not the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has power. And so how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, gave him the Holy Spirit and anointed him with power. And so um, if you want to experience the Holy Spirit in your life, you have to treat him like God. And there are very key things about God that are, that are true about all three of them. They do not force themselves on anyone. Jesus and his salvation does not force himself. He saved everybody, but not everybody is saved. The people who receive him and give room for him or believe in him, they receive. And this is one of the things about the anointing and the presence of God that a lot of people fail to understand. Uh, a key thing about God is draw near to him and he draws near to you. Knock and the door shall be opened. Those who hunger and thirst will be filled. That's, you know, that's like, you know, we've been talking about our youth service and things on Saturday night because I'm teaching our youth these kind of things but uh, um, about drawing near to God and, and those kind of uh, uh, truths because I want them to know about God. And I realize I probably ought to teach other people the same way uh, of some of these things because this action of lifting our hands toward him and responding to him in services, you'll find the anointing will come on you as you respond to him. It's an amazing thing because God is that way. He doesn't force upon people himself. He responds to hunger, faith, and us moving toward him. Draw near to God and he draws near to you. Can you say amen? Amen. So it's, it's just a principle about God. That's how he is with his creation. Faith moves toward him and he moves toward us. You start to speak in tongues and he gives more utterance. Some people want to wait until God forces the issue. You start. He gives utterance. The flow increases. The flow increases. You worship more. You move toward Him. You kneel in worship. You move toward Him with your heart and you find He moves toward you. It's a principle. It's how God is. It's a relationship. Are you with me? And so the more that we practice, old timers used to call it practicing the presence of God. And I love it. I love the presence and anointing of God. And so few people know how to flow with it and cooperate with it. But we want to learn. 
We want to learn the presence and the anointing and the grace of God flowing in our life and in our midst. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Oh, we worship you and honor you. So just make a move toward him. And it might be with your words, with your hands. Your, your, just make a move toward him that you haven't made yet tonight. Hallelujah. Maybe you haven't said something or you haven't lifted your hands yet or, or whatever that is. Whatever's in your heart, that's the most important thing. Moving toward him. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. What a day. Glorious things. Hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. How many love God's word tonight? You can be seated if you grab a Bible and we're going to go through some teaching here unless the Lord seems to lead differently. I want to tonight just go, and I'm sure many of you have heard these things, but I'll share them with everybody. There are people who may not have on the subject of Pentecost, the outpouring of God's Spirit. Of God's Spirit. And I want to share uh, this message tonight is called Experience Pentecost. Experience Pentecost. When I was a child, I grew up in a, in a setting where these things weren't even talked about. And as uh, Brother Lairdon shared, uh, even were talked against. So if you had brought up the subject that I'm going to preach about tonight, uh, these people actually would have said, no, there is no such thing. That actually what you're talking about is of the devil. That's a fact. Uh, anybody ever heard that kind of stuff? And, uh, and so um, that would have been the setting that I grew up in. Never, uh, you know, the book of Acts, I guess you would just tear that out of your Bible and kind of, you know, throw it in the fireplace or something because it, it just didn't apply to us today. And one of the most deadly things that have happened in the, in the church world and, um, and is what we call the doctrine of cessation. Uh, root word of that is cease. So the doctrine of cessation is a real doctrine in churches, not a Bible doctrine, but a man-made doctrine that says things like this. The gifts of the Spirit died with the first apostles, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, as it, is, as it is spoken about in the book of Acts, was to start the early church. But then you have to wonder, well, what are we supposed to do today? You know, I mean, if it was for the early church, if it was good for them, then apparently times must have gotten so much better. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit anymore, right? It ceased. That's the, the millions of Christians, not millions, many millions of Christians believe this erroneously, not because they're trying to believe something wrong, but because they're told wrong. And so they're not believing for, they're not receiving uh, what God has meant. And the thing that grieves my heart about it is, like I shared the other night, is that, is that this is the promise of the Father. The Father had to have been looking over the balcony of heaven going, that's what my son cleaned them up for. 
That's what I wanted. And the end result was I want to fill them with the Holy Spirit and let them be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and all over the world. And I don't know if, if I said it well enough on Friday night, but I meant to tell you this truth. Hopefully you got it, that the primary function of the Holy Spirit as revealed in Scripture is to take what Jesus did for us and make it a reality in our life. That's the primary function of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to make yourself a son. He makes you a son. Whatever is His, the righteousness of God, by the Spirit, He makes you the righteousness of God. So every day of your life, you want to walk in this fullness of the Holy Spirit because you're not making yourself a Christian. He's making you a Christian. He is. Christian means Christ is the anointed one. Christ, the anointing, he is making you anointed. He is making you like Jesus. People try to make their actions be more like Jesus and thank God we should and people should act more like him. But friend, just acting like Jesus doesn't make you a, 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 an anointed or a true Christian. The work of Christ is wrought in our life by the Holy Spirit. That's where power comes then to change our behavior, to be like Christ. But first, we become like Him because the Spirit does that work in us. So we don't have to try to make these things up in our life. The Holy Spirit, God is on board. Because what he wants us to have and be is so far beyond human reach, he had to come into us and upon us himself to make happen what he prepared for us. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. I mean, think about tongues. Wants us to speak for him made us to speak for him, made us to be a voice or vocal cords for him and says, let me just remove all the barriers of that and give them a tongue that they can just let flow out of their heart and it be the pure language of God. That's the Holy Spirit taking what Jesus did for us and making it real for us. Hallelujah. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Father is leaning over the balcony of heaven going, that's what I wanted. That's what I cleaned them up for. And then can you imagine people who don't want to experience it sat somewhere in a room together and voted on whether the doctrine of the church is going to be for Pentecost or not. So some guy that isn't even living in the reality of the Holy Spirit at all lifts his hand and goes, let me say something. You know, my great grandmother used to speak in tongues, but I've never spoken in tongues. Who would ever do something you don't understand? I make a motion that we put it in the, in the ordinances of the church that that was done away with. That that died with the early apostles. And so another guy, he, he doesn't want to live the spirit-filled life either. So he's like, I second that motion. And the, all the eyes have it. And next thing you know, it's in the doctrine of the church. This is literally how this stuff happens. You've seen it on the news in big ways. Whole denominations voting about scriptural things. I mean, doesn't it just break your heart? You know, you read the newspaper and go, they're having a convention in somewhere, Cleveland or somewhere. And, and they're having a convention and they're voting on things scripture clearly say. And then the next day the news comes out. Yeah, the, that denomination, that group of people said that's not the way it really is. This is how we're going to believe it. Just absolute nonsense. Amen. <laughs> Just absolute nonsense because people don't want to adhere to the word. 
Pentecost is one of those things. You cannot be a serious student of the Bible at all and not believe in Pentecost. I mean, if you read the Bible, you have to believe in it. Even the subject of tongues. You have to make some man-made doctrine to take tongues out of the Bible. It's there so much. You would have to make up something and say, well, it died with the first apostles or whatever. You cannot be a serious reader of the Bible and not go, wait a minute. That's not just in one verse. That's in a bunch of places, right? And so, and so I grew up in that, in that environment and, uh, of, of, and I didn't even know, I didn't know, but my father was killed in an accident, uh, a tractor accident. And I was with him when I was eight years old, when he was killed and, uh, saw it all happen and everything. And, and, uh, and so at eight years old, I lost my father and he was a minister, a preacher. I guess that's probably where I get it from. And, uh, and then Here's the, here's the part I want you to get and what I'm telling the little story to you is, is that after he passed, I found out from my mother that he and her had begun to see things in the Bible that they were wondering about, like Pentecost. And I actually found out my father was actually searching about some of those things with her. And then, and then uh, when he passed on, and then she began to search and, and began to be hungry. See, people who are hungry will get filled. God will get to people no matter what if they're hungry. Someone looking for the truth, you don't have to worry. They are going to find it. And so, and so she began to search along, you know, and, and nobody would help her. Nobody would help her. She's a widow and most of her children are, are, are you know, already gone. They're older and have moved out. And I'm, I'm the youngest of eight. And so, and so uh, you know, she begins to search. And one day, um, um, I guess that storytelling spirit's done got off on me now, but... <laughs> But long story short, because I want to I want to go through the book of Acts, but uh, my sister was sick and and I won't tell that story. And uh, my mother, when my sister was sick, um, my mother walked into a bookstore and saw a book for on sale and being a good Mennonite Amish woman, we love sales. And so if something's on discount, man, and so I, I still have this book in my office. She bought a book by Kenneth Hagin's called I Believe in Visions. Amen. And in that book, she bought it for 99 cents in a, in a bookstore in Stanton, Virginia. We lived in Gap Mills, West Virginia, where my sister was so sick and she bought that book, 99 cents, and read the book. And in the book, she, she found out two things, that God wants to heal people and that he fills people with the Holy Spirit. Because in the book is a vision the Lord gave Brother Hagin about the authority of the believer. And so my mother believed it, believed the scripture, took authority over that thing, and my sister was instantly healed. That's right. She was, she was healed instantly in one day, and she was very, very sick. And so she was healed. And then that got my mother going, well, if that's true, then the rest of this stuff must be too. And she began to study the book of Acts. I was about 11 years old at the time. I began to study it, underlining scriptures about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. And she started talking to some of her church family. And said, you know, I'm, I'm reading this, I'm searching this. And they said, oh, no, 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 that's of the devil. 
Nobody would help her. She's a widow in the mountains of West Virginia. Nobody would help her. Elders, people in the church wouldn't help her. I mean, they discouraged it. And matter of fact, no, 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 that, that's not right. You don't do that. So I guess Jesus decided he just had to override everybody. And one night he walked into her room and baptized her in the Holy Spirit. Glory be. She said he just walked right through the door. And not the door was open, not through the door, through, through the opening of the door. And she was laying in bed and she said, I, she said, when you see Jesus, there's only one response. And that's to lift your hands and worship him. Glory, hallelujah. And I said, well, what did you do? She said, the only thing that came out of my mouth was tongues. And she worshiped him in other tongues. And so then that was so real to her. She shared it with the family, shared it with me. And I began to study and learn about it myself. And, and, and then, of course, uh, uh, the rest of the story goes, you know, she shared it and she got excommunicated from the church. And that's how we came to Sarasota, Florida, <laughs> because uh, um, they told her, you know, you, can, you either recant that and say it's of the devil or we're going to excommunicate you. She, I'll never forget, she looked you right in the eyes with her eyes and say, how can I recant the Lord? I saw him. He baptized me in the Holy Spirit. How would I ever say that's of the devil to save my church membership? And they excommunicated and kicked her out. And uh, then she's wondering, well, what do I do? The Lord spoke to her in an audible voice in the yard in Gap Mills, West Virginia, and said, move to Sarasota, Florida. And she didn't even know where it was. So she got an atlas, found Florida, and, and, uh, and uh, found Sarasota. And within that, within no time, we had our farm for sale. We sold the thing. And once it was sold, we moved, she and I and a couple of, of my, my, really just she and I, uh, some of the others followed us then, moved to Sarasota, Florida. And that's why I'm here. And then we, we, we are here. We go to school. God calls me to Bible school, fills me with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, and uh, I get filled with the Holy Spirit here in Sarasota. And then she's praying for a little church. She, she has a prayer meeting going on at her house. And she's praying for a spirit-filled church to be raised up in Sarasota. And at that time, I was a little bit backslidden, not much. But on Sundays, I was out on the water, water skiing and having fun with my friends. And, uh, but God got me very quickly. I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I've been in church ever since. And so then uh, uh, Jennifer and I are sitting on our couch. This, I'm skipping a lot of stuff. I'm skipping a lot of stuff. But we're sitting on our couch in the meadows over here where our first apartment that we lived in after we were married and God told us to start a church, Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's the verse for our church. Arise, shine, your light has come. We're going to start Shining Light Bible Church. We called it Shining Light Bible Church because we are affiliated with Rhema Bible Church, and we just... Shining Light, use the extension, Shining Light Bible Church. We've since changed it to Shining Light Church because of the confusion with the denomination that we didn't really want to be identified with. Not Rama in Florida and just there's a Bible church that's a different, you know, denomination. So we kept being confused. So we changed it. Um, and then uh, Pastor Mary Lou and, and I began to study the history of Sarasota because we were doing our Bible college. And we found out that uh, the founder of Sarasota, the first man to found and put the post office and try to incorporate Sarasota, the, the history is pretty amazing. He was a righteous man, and, uh, and Sarasota does not have a very good history. I don't know if you know this or not. There's some really bad stuff that has happened here. The New York Times used to write that you don't go to Sarasota, Florida, because the life of people is less than a pig. 
That's a fact. Uh, vigilantes from Maaca City and out that way were killers. I mean, they would kill the righteous, steal their property. All oh, I mean, this is there's some really, really bad history about this area. I have books on them. I've, I've studied the history of it. We looked at it. And so there's some really crazy things. The founder himself was killed on the beach uh, uh, right down by the hospital. He owned all of that. And most of that land was stolen from him. Uh, there's just some really, really crazy history in, in Sarasota. And so uh, what we found out is that is that the man who was the founder of Sarasota went to Tampa to get them to incorporate and put a post office down here in old Osprey area of Sarasota out there uh, where Morton's is out there in that area. That's where it all started. There's still the old post office out there and everything. And so um, um, the man who started all that was a very good man. His name was Abby, by the way, if you ever want to research him. There's not much to be found because they want to hide this history because he was murdered in cold blood down on the water to steal his land later on. And so they put him, they took him out to sea and dumped his body. <laughs> Y'all didn't want to know this, did you? <laughs> but I, I, the reason it's coming up in me is because that's the spiritual battle we're fighting in Sarasota. And we're going to win it by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And so, and so uh, uh, what we found out, Pastor Mary Lou and I uh, uh, studying this stuff, was that he wanted to name the uh, Sarasota. The, 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 the water was called Sarah, Sarasota Bay. It was two kind of two words, Sarasota Bay. And so... Um, he wanted to call this city he was going to start, this commerce center, he wanted to name it Helena. And uh, that's right, he wanted to name it Helena, like the Helena in, you know, I think Washington. Uh, so he wanted to name it, he had his heart set on calling it Helena, and then he went to Tampa, he got all these people together and, and, uh, and to try to make this happen, make it illegal, get the first post office in and all of that, and they persuaded him to call it Sarasota after the bay. So they ended up calling it Sarasota, but he always, it's in his writings, he wanted it to be called Helena. And then, so we looked up, what does Helena mean? And so we, to lo and behold, to our surprise, it was what God spoke to us on our couch, shining light. Helena is shining light. And so now centuries, centuries, decades for sure, but, a, but nearly a century. It probably was. It's 1870, some of these things. And so, and so uh, uh, that many years later, God speaks to somebody listening to them and says, start a church called Shining Light. I have a funny feeling something he did back then still wants to live on today. And maybe God wants to do something in Sarasota that's amazing. Huh? All of that, to with, the, with the beginning of it, my mother had no one to help her. But hunger will always win. God will always respond to hunger. Glory, hallelujah. Aren't you hungry? Don't you love him? Let's get started here through the scriptures. I'll take you on a journey. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And we'll just, I'll... I'll just teach till, till my teacher falls out. <laughs> Minister named Dave Roberson used to say that. <laughs> Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Sometimes people read this and they go, be a witness, like say things. Of course we should and we should be a witness that way. But I think it may have a deeper meaning and mean that we're to be a witness of him. 
That means he's making what Jesus is real in us, and we are a testimony, a witness that what Jesus did is right and it is working. Wherever we are, we should be a witness that the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord is real. This baptism of the Holy Spirit, this Acts chapter 2 experience is for everyone. And here's the scripture. If, you, if you're in the book of Acts, that's where we're going now. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And it is our belief that God has called everyone. Called everyone. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance. So we see here that this Acts chapter 2 experience of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 38 there and just carefully look at it and examine it. He says, he says in response to them saying, what shall we do? He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the removal of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to work on that a little bit later as we go along. So Peter says here, this would be a prerequisite then. Repent and let every one of you be baptized. If someone repents and is baptized, aren't they already saved? Huh? Huh? I mean, doesn't he give an order here? Repent, be baptized. If someone is in fact baptized, aren't they already saved? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you something here. John chapter 20. Hold your place in Acts. You're real close there anyway. John chapter 20. And let's look at this experience of Pentecost. Follow it through in the Bible. John 20, and we're going to read verse 19 through 23. Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus has risen from the dead. And here the disciples are gathered. It says, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. That's a good thing to say when you come through the door, isn't it? <laughs> the doors were shut and he stood in their midst. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus is saying, sins have been dealt with. You can get rid of sins now. But the thing we want to see is, he comes to their disciples post-resurrection, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on them. Does that remind you of something else? God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into them the breath of life. Thank God for the breath of life. 
The day you eat of that fruit, you shall surely, or of that tree, you shall surely die. Jesus came to deal with the sin of man, to remove it as far as the east is from the west. When that work is accomplished, he comes to his disciples and says, sins are forgiven, you can retain them. You can re it's kind of strange language. All I know to say about it is sins have been dealt with. There's something you can do about them. But he says, Receive the Holy Spirit and breathes on them. It seems clear from this scripture and then over into the book of Acts that we are talking about two separate things. Being born of the Spirit and the Spirit of God coming to live in us and us being baptized in the Holy Spirit known as Pentecost. It is the experience of believers throughout history. People have been saved just like my mother, just like others. So many people saved, but not filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Apparently then, when one calls on the name of the Lord and is born again, sins are dealt with, the Spirit of God comes to live. I personally believe that's what John said or the Lord said through John that out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. And it says those who believe on me will receive the Holy Spirit. Out of our heart. I, I, don't, I, I have no question in experience with people that people are sure enough saved and have the Holy Spirit in their life but lack this Pentecostal experience of Acts chapter 2. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think we're pretty scriptural on the issue here. He breathed on them, and I believe that's where they got saved. Because one of the reasons I believe that is because Peter was pretty much a coward up until this point. But after this, he tarried in Jerusalem, waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit as promised. And listen, I think something changed in their heart. I think they were born again. <clears throat> so they go to Jerusalem as they're told to do, and they tarry there waiting for the promise of the Father. Let's go through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and this will be chronological pretty much, so you'll, you can just follow down through the, through the book. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They believed his promise. That's why they went and waited in Jerusalem. If they hadn't believed him, they would not have waited in Jerusalem for that endowment of power, that baptism, that filling of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to describe the difference of how he came to live in us at new birth and that baptism or filling of the Holy Spirit, but I see the distinction very clearly and the results speak for themselves. Galatians chapter 3, don't turn here because we're just keep it going in the book of Acts, but Galatians 3, 2 says, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? They believed what he said and they went to Jerusalem and waited there for the promise of the Father. We receive this, and I'm just going to go ahead and get ahead of myself so we can move right on through this. We receive this Pentecost 
by faith in the promise. When you see it and believe it, that's how you receive it. Galatians 3, 2 is clear. You receive the Spirit by faith. These people waited in the upper room. They believed Him. If you see it today and believe it, God will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power. It's a matter of seeing it and believing it. So they're waiting there as He told them to. And now we're in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and... We'll read verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. I'm glad there's one for each of us. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We're going to go through the book of Acts now. It's important for us to see this uh, uh, through the book. And there's three things we want to watch for and see if we can find a pattern. Three things we're going to watch for. Number one is this prerequisite of being a believer, and that is the requirement or the prerequisite for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's see if we can see that as a pattern. And then secondly, let's look at how they received this filling of the Holy Spirit and see if we can see some kind of pattern about that. And then thirdly, let's see whether tongues is revealed in the book of Acts. Because tongues is the big sticking point of this baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is where people stumble about it all over the place. Lots of people, well, yeah, spirit filled, but they struggle with the tongues part. But if it's in the Bible, I want it. Amen? And so let's see if there is some kind of pattern or some kind that we can see that we can go, hey, wait a minute, it seems to be pretty common in here. Acts, Acts chapter uh, 4 now. These disciples who had been filled in Acts chapter 2, they got in trouble, they're being persecuted and threatened. And so they got a prayer meeting going on. And when they had prayed, Acts 4.31... When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, these are the same people who were filled in Acts chapter 2. These are the disciples who are preaching the word. They get threatened by, I mean, they're told not to speak anymore. They're getting threatened. And so they get together with their company and they have a prayer meeting. That's a pretty good thing to do when you're in trouble. Have a prayer meeting. And in this prayer meeting, they pray and God answers their prayer by filling them with the Holy Spirit. So much so that the building, the place they're in is actually shaken. I'd like to see that today, wouldn't you? But the important part is, look, when the, uh, Kenneth Hagin used to say, he was pretty funny with some of these things. He used to say, he used to say, uh, people get all concerned when people shake. Wait till the building starts shaking. <laughs> <laughs> he said, man, people get all concerned when somebody shakes under the power of God. He said, wait till the buildings start shaking like they did in the book of Acts here. And the building and everything shook. The, what I love about this verse and this story when you read it later is when they were in trouble, God gave them an answer by filling them with the Holy Spirit. 
Hey, if there's problems going on, God, fill us with the Holy Spirit because now we can speak the word with boldness. The answer for a lot of things today would be for people to get filled with the Holy Spirit, have the power of God come on them, shake them, hallelujah, and let them walk out full of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Glory, hallelujah. We need some good Holy Spirit filling kind of meetings. We ought to be, man, there's trouble going on in my life. Let's get to church and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Apparently you can get filled over and over and get refreshing fillings because these people had been filled in Acts chapter 2, but now they're in a prayer meeting and they're getting filled again. Glory, hallelujah. I don't know what scientifically to say about this, but the Bible's the Bible and they're getting filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Glory, hallelujah. Wouldn't mind having a prayer meeting tonight and getting a fresh dose, fresh filling of the Holy Spirit right here tonight at Shining Light. Woo, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Fill me with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. Baptize me in the precious Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Put me under over and over and over. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Glory. Hallelujah. Woo! Yes! I'm in trouble. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me boldness to speak your word. Fill me with... Hallelujah. Yes! Spirit-filled is what we need. That's where Paul said, My preaching is not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. That your faith is not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God. It does something for you. I could name people in this church who came to this church years ago who God's power fell on them. They fell in the floor in the carpet and were set free from major drug addictions and today are ministers. That's a fact. This stuff does stuff that nothing else does. The wisdom of God cannot do, excuse me, the wisdom of man cannot do what the power of God can do. Seems strange to the natural man, but it does things that are amazing. Glory, hallelujah. Baptize us in the Holy Spirit again and again. That's what we see from this scripture is this is not a one-time thing. You get a little dry, ask him to fill you again. <laughs> I don't know, how do you get more of him? That's not the issue. I think the issue is, is what he's doing on us and in us. And for some reason, it's here in the Bible. They're getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. Now, Acts chapter 8. I might get excited about this tonight, so watch out. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 18. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do we see something here? They had, if you receive the word that the apostles had preached, and you are baptized, don't you think these people are saved? Of course they are. But then they send these apostles down there to make sure they're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's pretty clear to me. 
These are believers. These are believers, and Peter and John go down to them and pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, here's another point. Oh, I love teaching this stuff. I wish I had you in Bible school. Here's another point. You don't lay hands on people to get saved. Right? So this is how we do, this is how you create doctrine that is biblical. You look at the word and find the patterns all throughout it and that's how biblical doctrine. That's why we believe in these things. Not an isolated verse somewhere but patterns, things you see where you can easily go, look. There's no way that could be salvation because nowhere in Scripture do you lay hands on people when they get saved or to get them saved. Right? So these are saved people not knowing and not having received this Pentecost yet. And Peter and John come and they say, look, let's lay hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came. Glory. And they received the Holy Spirit. Now look what happened. Uh, chapter, uh, excuse me, right there, verse 18. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. And if you read on in the story, he wanted, the, he wanted this gift, he wanted this ability to be able to lay hands on people and then get the Holy Spirit. And they said, oh, no, that, that's not right. You don't pay for this. And, and they corrected him in no uncertain terms. But the reason I went on to that next verse is Simon saw that when they laid hands on him, they received the Holy Spirit. I wonder what he saw. Huh? Did he see the Holy Spirit? No, he must have seen something happen in their life and go, wait, something awesome happens. I'd like to have that gift to lay hands on people. If I can buy it, I'll buy it. <laughs> Chances are he saw the same thing we see in other places. We'll see in just a minute. Acts chapter 9 now. Next chapter. Remember Paul, or Saul, who was later Paul? He had this amazing experience we call the Damascus Road experience. Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, because I'm trying to just cram through the book of Acts, I don't want to read these stories in length. But when Paul had that light shine, remember he was on his way? Remember that the first words out of his mouth? Does anybody remember what they were? That's right. Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ananias knows this. He is sent by God to Paul and he's sent to him. And when he gets to Saul or Paul, when he gets to him, he says, what does he say? Exactly. Brother Saul. <laughs> this is pretty clear stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you has sent me to you. So you'll get filled with the Holy Spirit and get your sight back. So Saul is saved, but now needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Ananias, it goes on to say, laid his hands on him and said, receive your sight and so forth. Acts chapter 10. And by the way, as we're moving along, there's a couple landmarks. Acts chapter 10 is approximately 10 years after Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 10 cures the doctrine of cessation. 
for two reasons. It's after Pentecost, and it is not the apostles, it is Gentiles who are being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not even the Jews, it's not the apostles, it is a family of Gentiles who now are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Jews could hardly believe it. He's given the same Holy Spirit to Gentiles that we have? But it, it, it cures the doctrine of cessation because it's 10 years after the original uh, Acts chapter 2 Pentecost. And it is also common people, not just that beginning group. Okay, let's read it. Acts 10, 44 through 46. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. Now, in this case, it seemed like the Holy Spirit fell like things just happened simultaneously. It's a little different than the other ones. But look at verse 45. Those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Huh? Are, is, it, is it getting clear and more clear? They saw something and said, wow, they got the same Holy Spirit. What did they see? This is an Italian uh, um, general. He's a, he's a, he's a high-ranking uh, person. He, his family, he's, God has told him by an angel to go get Peter to come and preach to him. And an angel prepared Peter for the same thing. And then they came and Peter's preaching there. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. And they speak in tongues and magnify God. High-ranking official. Friend, this isn't just for people who are too dumb to know better. It's not just the dummies who speak in tongues. It's high-ranking officials who get filled with the Holy Spirit. Huh? And they knew they had been filled with the Holy Spirit because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Ten years after Pentecost. Let's keep going. Acts 13, 52. I hope you're going to study these. Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Here they are again, getting filled all over again. The disciples are filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. No wonder lots of times when the Holy Spirit is in manifestation in services and, and uh, in, with people, there's lots of joy. One of the things the book of Acts says lots of times, and the city was, when the word came, the city was filled with joy. And it, over and over in the book of Acts, there was joy in the city when the word came. There was joy. Seems like the Holy Spirit moving and joy are kind of synonymous. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. Now, let's go to the last one we'll look at tonight, Acts 19. And these are pretty easy to remember. Acts 10 was nearly 10 years after Acts 2. And Acts 19 is about 20 years after Acts 2. So 20 years later, what were they still doing? And it happened, verse 1, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Are we seeing it again? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? A little side note right here. I, I was, when I was in Bible college at Rama in, 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 in Oklahoma, um, I worked at a place where a backslidden Pentecostal son of, I think of a preacher, I don't remember for sure, but he was just as backslidden as he could be. God brought me into that place to manage a call center while I was going to school just to get that guy back on track. Because I, I, I just, I go after those people. 
God brought me a lot of people like that, like Daryl and, you know, all these, these backslidden uh, uh, pastors, sons, uh, tons of them came through into my life over the years, and I, I'd get them fired up for God, meet them and get them fired up for God. And uh, with this, this guy, backslidden Pentecostal, so he wanted me to go. I got him back to God. I mean, he was a mess. I got him back to God. I said, hey, come on. And like I do, I got him on his knees and told him to confess and get right with God. You know, call on the name of the Lord. Let's get it. Let's get going here. And so, and so uh, uh, he wanted me to go to church at, at, at where he used to go to church. And I had never been in a Pentecostal church. Now, when we say Pentecostal, you know, in this church, we mean believing in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a denomination called Pentecostal that gets real interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's different kinds of them. Yeah, I mean, there's ones like, like Brother Steve's saying here that were just as strict as us Amish folks and stuff. I mean, the women wear their hair in a bun, you know, and they can't go to movies or women don't wear makeup and, you know, just lots of rules, man-made rules. And, uh, and then they have some interesting things about the, the Holy... Anyway, but I went there and they declared that I needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus. These were what we call Jesus-only people. And so there's this denomination that believes that if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus, and you say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're actually not saved. Because in the book of Acts, one, one or two places it says, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Which only, it was not a formula, it meant they were baptized not in John's baptism, but in Jesus' baptism. The formula for baptism is, in fact, Jesus gave it to us, and if he wanted it different, he should have said it different. So he said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why we adhere to that baptism. Uh, uh, uh. But here it is. Here's another proof. This is how you form doctrine, folks. Here's another proof. Is if you had been baptized in the baptism of Jesus and not John's, you would have already heard that there is a Holy Spirit. This stuff is too fun. I just can't. This stuff is just too awesome. I mean, the Bible is so good. It answers its own questions. He's, he's, he's literally saying, if you had been baptized, they said we were baptized in John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. And, and the baptism of Jesus is baptized in the name of the Father, new covenant baptism, the Son and the Holy Spirit. If they had been baptized that way, they would have went, Holy Spirit? Exactly. <laughs> Is this good stuff or what? <laughs> and so, and so uh, now they're, so they're baptized. He, let, let me see here. John, the baptized of Antis, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would cover that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. I didn't finish a story in Oklahoma, so I went to a night meeting in that Pentecostal church. They tried to baptize me before I left. I had to get out of there. I mean, they desperately... <laughs> I mean, they, they, they tried to, they wanted to baptize me in the worst kind of way. I said, no, I've been baptized. I've been baptized. No, you had, no, you have, you must. They, was it in the name of Jesus? I said, well, they didn't say in the name of Jesus. They said in the name of the Father, Son, and, but I was baptized into Jesus' baptism. And they said, no, no, that does, that's, that's not a, you must be, back. they tried to corral me and baptize me. I never went back there. I tell you, it scared the living daylights out of me. Like they're going to catch me and baptize me before I get out of here. I had never seen anything like that. Neither had I seen people work themselves up in a frenzy to try to speak in tongues. It was just some really weird stuff, you know. But friend, just because things are, are weird doesn't mean there's not a real. The real is beautiful. Glory, hallelujah. 
And so what did he do? Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of... When Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Can we see those three things kind of as a pattern? Some of them are a little bit different, but it's pretty clear that there was laying on of hands to receive. Huh? That's there more than once. It seemed that the common method of the apostles when they went somewhere was to lay hands on people for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Second thing of the first thing in the order that I had them earlier is they were believers. And the last thing is it pretty much either, either seems like it or specifically says it, that they knew it because they saw something and in most cases says they spoke with tongues and prophesied. That settles the issue for me, doesn't it? 20 years later, Paul says, hey, they need to receive the Holy Spirit. Let's lay our hands on them and let them be filled with the Holy Spirit after their baptism which means after they're certainly saved in the name of the Lord, now they're candidates to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I think we blur this sometimes, and people are not receiving the benefit of true Pentecost because we're not sure that it really is something else to be believed in. That when one believes or hears of the Holy Spirit, they can be filled with the Holy Spirit. The testimony of so many people. And then let's just finally, tongues. There are so many biblical benefits. I, I'm not going to teach on it, but just give you the list for you to study. There's the benefit of prayer. Romans 8, 26, if you want to put it in your notes. There's the benefit of prayer. You don't know what to pray for as you ought. The Holy Spirit helps you. And Paul says you can pray. In 1 Corinthians 14, he says you can sing in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, that would be worship. Jude 20 says you build yourself up on your most holy faith. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says you speak mysteries. Isaiah 28, 11 through 12 says there's a refreshing with stammering lips. There's a refreshing that comes to you. Praise God and a lot of other things. But tongues isn't the issue. Tongues is a benefit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is the issue. And tongues is a beautiful benefit in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for that promise of the Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand up together. We give you thanks and praise. How many believe in this baptism or filling of the Holy Spirit? We give you all the praise, all the glory tonight. If you dare ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, if you believe, ask him, fill me with the Holy Spirit tonight. We give you praise. We receive by faith this wonderful promise, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We give you all the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.